Hey guys, welcome back to Ronnie Rambles episode seven. I already made a mistake in my episode title screens, but it's fine. Whatever. I'm trying not to let perfection be the death of me. <laughs> so um, it has been an insanely crazy week. Um, those of you who are watching on um, YouTube may see that I am in yet another environment <laughs> uh, as I try to carve out a spot in my household during a pandemic to be alone and do 30 minutes of recording. It's You would think it's much easier. But I am now in my bedroom, which is this blue wall, uh, my basement got flooded last week because my sump pump lost power because it tripped the outlet and we didn't know and it's been raining like insanity. Uh, so yeah, that was like the icing on um, first week back of classes cake. <laughs> so for those who don't know, I teach at a local community college and classes started this week. And I am one of the few faculty members who are giving classes face-to-face. -face. So I have three uh, different courses that are what we consider blended courses. So I have split the classes in half, and I teach half the class face-to-face -face one day of the week. And then the other day that we would normally meet as an entire class, I meet the second half of the class face-to-face. Um, so it's been an insane week for me because I have extra classes this semester just due to need from the college. So I, I've kicked off six courses, uh, but three of those are blended. So I had to give the first day lecture for those three courses six times in addition to my remote courses, which I'm doing first day lectures online. And I have a fully online section. So it's been a little crazy because it's also it's, you know, September. So the kids, my kids are going back to school next week. So all of their back to school nights and when to pick up their equipment and how they're going to manage remote learning because we are not going back into the classroom here in Maryland. So I have an elementary student. So we have to figure out his transitions in an online remote uh, way. And then I have a high school student, which I, I am trusting that he can manage it himself. He is 15 after all. And then my own courses with my own students. Um, and along, you know, my husband works full time too. So we are uh, stretched thin like every other person on the planet right now. So it's been crazy. So the basement flooding, however, I was like, are we serious? Right? <laughs> Is this happening? It was just like, honestly, I immediately got overwhelmed and mad. And then I took a deep breath and I said, you know what? I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to deal with this right now. There's nothing I can do that will change the situation. I'm just going to have to, we'll, we'll figure it out together. So then I kind of took a deep breath and told the husband who went through like the same series of emotions. Like he was really angry at Matt at first. And then he was like, okay, okay, we'll figure this out. So, so we're figuring this out. I'm, I'm kind of looking at it as, as a positive because we've been wanting to pull and the carpet out of our basement anyway and put some flooring down there. So maybe this will accelerate that process. <laughs> but I did not want to be forced to do it right now. Anyway, that's enough of my own personal craziness. Uh, I'm sure you guys have stories that are very similar at this time of year. So uh, there was a few things I wanted to talk about. And one of them um, is inspired by a listener, Suzanne, who we've been chatting on um, Facebook and it's been fantastic because we share a, a horror movie love. And um, she brought up last week about uh, entering food into a food journal. So that's kind of what inspired my, um, my goal this week is to talk about how we allow perfection to kind of derail us from our goals and how we really perfect failure. That's kind of how I'm looking at it. This, you know, it's a play on words, but we have this need for things to be perfect. And when they're not perfect, we use it as an excuse to stop pursuing that goal or to give up on it. And that's why I'm calling it perfecting failure. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And then last week, I think, or two weeks ago, because last week I did the interview, I think I mentioned how I don't like to watch uh, series because I don't want the investment, so I usually watch movies. Well, I'm going to take a completely 180 turn on that. Uh, so I have two series I want to talk about um, just for fun to inspire and um, actually three, three series. All right. So 
we'll end with some more um, media recommendations because I am finding it to be a nice welcomed uh, like escape to get lost in in some stories and fun media stuff right now. So, but let's talk about um, perfection for a minute. So let me share a few things or a few ways that I have allowed perfection to derail me in the past and then you can just mentally agree or disagree or relate, <laughs> if you will. Uh, that's how I approach everything, kind of through my own lens and then I find that it's a great way to kind of connect to other people's experiences. So ways that I have allowed perfection to derailed me from my goals, um, mostly in the realm of, you know, fitness or health and wellness or weight loss and those kinds of things. Cause you know, you guys know that's kind of where I'm coming from with this stuff. So one, I will stop entering food in my food journal when it gets hard. And what I mean by that is I'm, I'm a parent, I'm a mom. I don't have the luxury of just preparing food only for myself. When I'm preparing food, I'm preparing food for my family. And <clears throat> I was really adamant when my kids were little that I was not going to make special meals for them. You know, like they weren't going to just eat chicken nuggets or just eat mac and cheese. Like if I made, you know, chicken and mashed potatoes for dinner, then we're all eating chicken and mashed potatoes for dinner. You know, you don't have to eat as much of one thing or maybe as long as you try a bite, it's, you know, that's been my parenting philosophy. So when I started to look at dietary decisions I was making for my own fitness goals, um, it's a lot easier to say track macros or calories when you say just eat plain chicken and you don't make, say, a casserole or you, um, you know, if you're just cooking for yourself or just preparing meals for yourself. You can just weigh out exactly what you want and these few things, right? But normally I'm making family dinners that are more like a stir fry over rice or like a skillet with ground beef and vegetables and chilies and things like that. And it's time consuming. Uh, it's a job to to not only come up with dinners every night, but that's a whole other story, <laughs> but, and to prepare them. But then if you want to actually accurately know what you're consuming in the sense of macros, like carbohydrates, fat, and protein, or even just calories, you have to enter the whole recipe in, you know, an application like MyFitnessPal or something. And then you have to like weigh out portions. And then you know that this many portions are in that, you know, in that recipe, and then each portion has about this many calories. You know, it's a nightmare if you actually want to be specific. Um, I'm not like saying that is the only way to make changes or lose your weight, but if you really do want to have that precision in your diet, you have to do a little bit of work there or a lot of work really to kind of figure out macros for those kinds of meals. And so, a lot of times, I would get overwhelmed and I'll be like, forget it. I I just, I don't, you know what? I just want to make a skillet and eat it and not worry about how many stinking protein grams are in it. I just want to do it. And so I went through that pattern a lot where I would like be able to count all of my uh, macros and calories and all that stuff during the day because I was just preparing, you know, lunch for myself. I would grab a couple ounces of turkey breast. I'd have a yogurt cup. I'd have, you know, a granola bar, you know, with the nutritional information right there on the package. And then it would come to dinner time and it would be like, all right, so we're having this like chicken and broccoli stir fry and it has a sauce. Do I count the sauce? I don't know if I should count the sauce. Maybe, maybe I could just use soy sauce. I don't, you know, and you go through like this series of like thought processes of how you're going to count it. And then you get overwhelmed and then you just throw your hands up and you're like, forget it, forget it. And then you stop tracking altogether. I'm, I'm saying you, but what I really mean is me. I have done that. I still do that sometimes. I'll get overwhelmed. And then I'll let the fact that being perfect about things uh, is hard. Or actually, it's the hardness of being perfect, meaning it would be time consuming for me to do all that. And then I just like let it go. When really all I need to do is estimate. So that's what Suzanne and I were talking about um, when she inquired on kind of how I get over this. And she confessed to me that she gets overwhelmed and she doesn't want to put her salads. She makes you like salads and she doesn't want to like put every ingredient in her salad in my fitness pal. And I was like, oh, 
I get that. <laughs> I do that all the time. Um, but the way over that hump is to let go of your perfection of having to put in every specific ingredient and estimate, embrace the estimation and have faith that it's close enough. And that mentality will take you further than anything else, right? So I'll give a few examples of this because I feel like I'm rambling and not making sense. So for example, I make rice a few nights a week. I have perfected my rice making technique thanks to a friend who also has a new YouTube channel. I will share his channel. Uh, it's Wasim and he makes, he's he's from India and he's taught me so much about like how to cook things. <laughs> his, he shared a few recipes. Um, but specifically, I will forever be in his, um, oh, what's that phrase? I will be ever indebted to him for teaching me his rice technique. So I have, I was horrible at making rice forever. And then he's like, oh, just do it this way. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. I can't mess it up now. So I make basmati rice a few times a week to either be the bottom of a stir fry or a side dish with some fish or something like that. Now, the way that I make rice is I sometimes use a little bit of oil and I'll put some like scallions or something in the pan before and I, and I soften them and then I'll add some water, bring it to a boil, add the rice. And then once the rice is done, I'll drain it and then I'll put in a little bit more oil and salt and any other flavorings I happen to want. Maybe a squirt of lime, a squirt of lime if I'm doing something more like like a like a salmon where I want some like citrus or maybe a sprinkle of like red pepper flakes if I want it spice, you know, whatever I'm doing that matches what I'm cooking. Well, I don't measure. I don't measure the oil. I'm not going to lie. I I don't sit there with a tablespoon and I just do a dollop, <laughs> okay? I mean, sometimes you just have to do a dollop of something and be okay with it. And then I fluff it with the fork, put the little spish of salt in there, and put the top on until we're ready to eat it. So when it comes to counting that, how do I count that? I can't count it just as rice because I've I've added fat and other ingredients. Um and I didn't weigh it and I didn't measure it because I'm in the craziness of cooking dinner with two kids and a husband and family. And I'm not going to be sitting there with like micro measurements just because I want to count macros. So I do. I actually use, uh, oh my gosh, my brain is failing me, um, Chipotle's chili lime rice um, from my fitness pal. So I did a couple, like I spent a few minutes looking at what kind of options I had to enter rice into my my food journal. And then I realized that, oh, you know, it's, this is really similar to like Chipotle's rice. I'll just use that. So when I make my plate for dinner, I'll dollop on some rice and I'll weigh it, you know, if I really am counting and I'll be like, okay, that's 200 grams of rice. And in my fitness pal, I'll just put 200 grams of Chipotle's rice. It has a little bit of fat in there. It's, it's got the carbs, of course, because rice is rice. And I'm like, that's close enough. Like, what am I going to be off? A couple grams? And again, I know some people are super specific and you have very specific goals, but I would argue most people are going to be fine with the kind of uh, margin of error when it comes to reaching their goals. So instead of letting the fact that you perfectly didn't know exactly how many fat grams were in your rice and you didn't count it at all and then you stopped keeping your food journal and then you went, oh, screw it. I might as well now eat some ice cream right? because I'm not counting anymore. That mentality is out there. I know because I have that mentality and I struggle with that myself. So instead of going down that path of I can't be perfect, so I might as well not do anything at all, you should go, well, this salad is pretty close to this salad. That's good enough. Enter it. Move on. If it's off, it's off. The point of keeping a food journal, tracking macros, tracking calories, whatever you happen to be tracking, is sometimes not about the precision of it. It's more about the awareness, the consciousness, and the information to use to make your next decision in, your, in food, right? So when you throw it away and you let perfection stop you from entering anything at all, you then stop altogether and you don't track anymore and you give up and you just say this is too hard. But when you just accept that it might not be perfect, I'm going to enter this in, 
even if it's off a few grams, you're still using the information like, okay, well, I had dinner and it was about this, you know, many calories or this many protein or this many carbs or whatever it is. So I still have a little bit left over to eat this or hmm, I, I used I used my daily cap. I shouldn't really eat anymore. What it allows you, it just keeps you moving towards the goal, even though the specifics may be off a little bit. And I feel like this is probably the biggest thing that people struggle with when they do try to use food journaling, excuse me, or tracking or something like that. Well, I'm really losing my voice this week because I think I've been doing so many lectures. So I've been talking so much more. It's so funny. Um, But anyway, that was what we talked about. So for Suzanne's um, thing, I think she'd mentioned salad. And I just wrote back and I said, well, why don't you just find like a garden salad from some restaurant? Just use that. And then she was like, oh, that makes so much sense. And so we had like a nice back and forth about it. And so I was happy to kind of push her, you know, to kind of change her approach. Um, But it really got me thinking about how we use that perfection with everything. So I do it at the gym as well, right? So uh, I can use an example from yesterday, actually. I have shifted my gym workouts to the evenings this week because I, I knew I wasn't getting enough sleep. And I can wake up and go to the gym at 5 a.m. I know that. Uh, it doesn't, I could do that if I go to bed at nine or if I go to bed at midnight, I still can wake up at five and go to the gym. The problem is because I'm that kind of person that sets an alarm and gets up, uh, I'm not getting enough sleep <laughs> because I've been staying, my days have been so full and so busy that at the end of the day, I do want to unwind and watch something on TV or hang out with my husband or even play a board game with the kids or whatever. And I I wasn't going to bed until 10, 11, sometimes midnight, and I would still wake up at 5 a.m. go to the gym. I need sleep, and I'm tired of kind of pretending like I don't. <laughs> I do need sleep. So I was like, okay, we're going to try this evening workout thing. So this week I did go to the gym around 7 p.m. after dinner. The kid, My kids are older now, so I can switch things up. Uh, and it's been it's been nice. It's been different. It's been nice because I usually have the gym to myself because uh, I belong to a small little like crossfit boutique gym and everyone else is leaving by 7.30. So I end up being able to blast my music and lift weights and it was been a really nice relief. Uh, but it's also weighing on me all day that I still have that to do, right? So it'll be like, oh my gosh, well, I've already had this great full day and I still have to go to the gym. Oh, so I'm, I'm hoping to change my mentality here uh, and adopt this new schedule. That said, so last night I'm at the gym. I'm by myself. I have a workout from Deep, who I interviewed last week. And my workout was like 10 rounds of three different moves. I'm like 10 rounds. Okay, so I start, and as I'm going through the workout, I realize after the second round, I cannot continue doing one of the moves. It was rope climbs, and I can I can climb a rope, but I can't do it over and over and over again. I just get fatigued, and I'm not going to hurt myself. So I was presented with a situation where I couldn't do what I needed to do perfectly, all right? I couldn't do what was prescribed to me perfectly. So after the second round, I made the decision – Uh, you know what, I'm going to do a scaled rope. So I lay on the ground and I just kind of lift my body up and back down. So I'm still working all the same muscles. Uh, It's just, it's a scaled version of the movement. But in that moment, I did have to fight a little bit of my perfection gene. Well, I was like, well, if I can't do it, I shouldn't do it at all. um, And just walk away from it. Instead, I was like, no, I'm going to adjust a little bit to my abilities and still do this. And every round after that, was a struggle. I'm not going to lie. It was like, okay, that's round four. Okay, that's round five. Um, And then once I hit five, I was like, okay, I'm halfway done. But I was playing mental games with myself the entire time. And then there was always this little thought in the background of, well, I'm not really doing it the way I'm supposed to be doing it anyway. So I might as well just not do it at all. And again, that's that perfection gene of percent of doing anything Okay, wait, how do I say this? Instead of doing something not quite perfect. No, that's not where I want to go. Wait, so I want to do something perfectly, but if I can't do it perfectly, I won't do it at all. 
that's the mentality I'm trying to um, fight amongst myself or within myself, which I know that you may also be struggling with that. So point here is if you do keep a food journal, embrace the estimization. And again, I, uh, other, I'm sure trainers or coaches may disagree with me on this, but I would argue to, especially early on, if you're trying to make positive changes, embrace the estimization early on. You can always get more precise, but until you break the habit of walking away from it because you're not perfect, I would argue that estimating is always better than not doing anything at all. And then after you've been doing it for a while, you can focus on the precision. But I'm a big believer in small chunks in the beginning, like making the positive change. And this is, I talked a little bit with Aaron about this last week, that in the beginning of me discovering fitness, I had to just throw darts at a dartboard and try lots of different things. If I focused in on one little thing, it I don't know if I would have been able to adopt like the healthy habits that I adopted. So embrace estimization, move on, and don't let your need for perfection prevent you from doing something at all, right? Just say, okay, I'm not going to be perfect at this. That's okay. Estimate and then keep moving down that path. And over time, you may get perfect at it or at least closer to perfect. Okay, so that was truly a ramble, I think. (laughs) Hopefully... It landed on some of you and it made sense, if you even are still listening. And that's okay. But all right, I'm going to move on to some fun stuff because I do have recommendations. So like I said earlier, I did embrace uh, some series right now. So first one I'm going to talk about, I think I'm trying to think about what order I'm going to do this in. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Cobra Kai. So those of you who grew up in the 80s know Karate Kid, of course. and We've been wanting to watch Cobra Kai since it came out years ago. It's it's already been two seasons. They're working on a third season. But it was released on YouTube Bread. And I draw a line in the sand. I am not signing up for any more subscription services. <laughs> so uh, it's been inaccessible to me. Well, recently, as in last, last week, I think, or two weeks ago, it has moved to Netflix. So now you are able to watch Cobra Kai which is, of course, Danny from Karate Kid's arch enemy, Johnny's Karate Dojo. (laughs) You guys are going to think I'm crazy, but uh, I was a huge fan of Karate Kid. Uh, And Karate Kid 2 somewhat, but then after that, I don't pay attention to the other ones. Regardless, doesn't matter. Uh, If you liked Karate Kid and it has a place in your heart as a childhood favorite movie, and you've watched it multiple times as I have, and you remember lines from the movie, you will absolutely positively love the first season of Cobra Kai. It was trippy. (laughs) It was so cool to see these characters brought back to life in their middle agedness. Um, And that alone, like take plot out of it, is just fun. It's just really fun to have like a childhood movie be brought back to life with the same actors and the same characters uh, it's fantastic. So my husband and I totally binged the first two seasons and we just got done. <laughs> like, uh, not yesterday, the day before we finished the last two episodes of the second season. And it has shifted from YouTube to Netflix. So Netflix will be doing the third season next year. I think it's, it's coming out next year. They did a trailer for it, but it's not really a trailer for the next season. It's more of a it's more just talk, showing you scenes from the last two seasons. That said, <laughs> this is my critique of Cobra Kai. And those of you who have are also watched it, you will have to let me know if you agree. I absolutely love Johnny and Danny, like their relationship. And, it, and it's like, uh, how do you, like they're, uh, it's almost like a bromance. <laughs> it's really like, a, like, like they love to hate each other, right? But as a fan of the original movie and watching these characters kind of grow, I want them to be friends. Like you want them to be mature adults and get over their childhood indifferences and just become friends. And the show has this 
horrible yo-yo effect of like bringing it really close to them becoming friends and then ripping it back from you and then bringing them really close to them ripping it back from you and I'm getting tired of that yo-yo I'm like oh my gosh let's just let them be friends already <laughs> so that's my big critique the second I think the first season was way better than the second season of course that's you know because it was still had that newness um the end of the second season left some I wasn't the biggest fan, but I am still looking forward to the third season just because I love being able to like check in on these characters' lives for whatever reason. And Johnny has totally won me over. Like I'm a big Johnny fan now for some re <laughs> for some reason. Okay, so that was recommendation one: Cobra Kai on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, um, or if you didn't know it was on Netflix, sometimes I do feel like I'm giving you guys all old news. Like I'm sure you guys already know all this. Okay, the second one. Uh, is a season, it's on HBO. So I'm sorry if you don't have HBO. Uh, we kept HBO for Game of Thrones and now we're, we just never left Game of, or left HBO. Uh, so we got hooked into this documentary series called The Vow. I think it premieres on Saturdays. There's only two episodes available right now. So we're still, it's still being released. The first episode was fascinating. It's a documentary about basically a cult, very, uh, I can't remember what it's called, Nexium, I think, or something like that. Um, but it's very Scientology-like. So the first episode really drew me in just to this, they're, they're, they have a lot of footage because one of the people who were was in this organization who they're interviewing is a videographer, and I think they just have so much footage of everything. So they're interviewing a lot of people and it's just, it's a little bit artsy, the documentary, but it's the story is just sucking me in. Um, and the people are really raw that they interview and talking about, um, you know, why they uh, started to join this organization and then how it became kind of creepy to them. So the second episode we watched last night and... Uh, I'm really looking forward to the, th the third episode because they're get they're slowly getting into the dysfunction of this organization. They're not like coming right out and saying it. And to be frank, I don't know anything about them, so I don't ever remember reading anything in the news. I don't, you know, it's just some, not on my radar. So everything that they're unveiling is 100% uh, new to me. So I've been really enjoying that, and I have to wait though. For now, episode three. This is why <laughs> uh, sometimes I don't like series, especially series that you can't binge because I get into it and then I can't watch it. All right, so now the third one, and I'll probably lose my horror movie uh, title here again because I'm more of a hobbyist of things. I don't really get into things too too much, but it's a Hulu. It's on Hulu. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I don't want to make people get subscription services either. I totally agree. Um, but it's called Nosferatu, but it's spelled N-O-S for A-2, like a license plate. So for those who've never, I, I don't know, I, again, I, I, maybe because I'm a parent, I have a full-time job, I can't keep up <laughs> with things the way I used to. Um, I don't remember how I stumbled across it. I think I read an article talking about it. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll check this out. And I watched the first episode and it kind of drew me in. It's a horror. It's in the horror genre. It's about this main character, Vic, who she's like a creative, meaning that she has like the ability like to, oh, I can't remember what they call the thing, but she can like drive over this bridge and it takes her to lost things, okay? And then there's like this creepy guy who abducts children and he uses them to like make himself younger. I don't want to give too much away, um, but you can already see where I'm going with this. It's very, it's creepy and it's got like vampire undertone. I'm only five episodes into the first season. There are two full seasons and they, um, and today... I just found out that three days ago they announced they are canceling it. So I'm like, seriously? But I still wanted to bring it up <laughs> because I am enjoying the first season even though I'm not done with it yet. And I feel like in this day and age, someone might pick it up like kind of how Netflix picked up Cobra Kai and now it's switched from YouTube to Netflix. So I feel like there is a chance if there's enough fans of the show that they'll somebody else will buy it and continue the storyline. So that said, it has um, – as I was watching it, I'm like, man, this feels 
I'm not even kidding about this. So you guys will laugh at me, but I'm like, this feels like a Stephen King book. Like it's just has this like Stephen King feeling. Now, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. I love Stephen King's stories. I am not a fiction reader. I have attempted to read his books and I'm bad at it. (laughs) I just, I fall asleep when I read and then I'm just not a good fiction reader. But that said, when in the 80s and 90s, you know, when they started turning Stephen King stories into movies, I am the biggest Stephen King movie fan ever. I love all of all of his work that they have translated into movies. And I know those of you who read will be like, there's nothing like the book. And I'm sure that is true. And I'm sure the books are way better. But I'm thankful that they at least bring those stories to life for someone like me who is a bad reader. So as I'm watching this, I'm like, it feels like Stephen King. So then I do what I do and I go down the rabbit hole of IMDb and I'm like, okay, it's, it is a book. So that's cool. And it's written by this guy, Joe Hill. I'm like, okay. So then I start reading about Joe Hill. Well, then I find out Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? (laughs) So I was like all proud of myself that I kind of knew. And so I think I read an article where he used the pen name Joe Hill because he didn't want to like, you know, ride the coattails of his father's success. Um, So I just thought that was really intriguing and fun and interesting little nugget. Uh, Again, you guys might have known that. I feel like I'm just discovering this stuff right now. So if you do happen to have Hulu, um, just do a search for Nosferatu and, uh, and it has, um, Oh, I don't remember the actor's name. He's the guy who plays uh, Spock in the reboots of Star Trek. And he was in American Horror Story in the first season and a couple seasons, I think. Um, no, maybe just the first season. But anyway, he plays this um, Charlie Manx character who's like the bad guy. And he's so good at it. I love this guy in bad guy roles. Um, but so if you haven't have Hulu, check it out. And if I if you already knew all this stuff, you guys have to let me know because I feel like I'm I'm very much behind the curve. I am not cutting edge on uh, ne- media news. Uh, I'm just kind of I'm just happy I have time to watch an hour long episode of a show before I fall asleep. At the end of the day, that's kind of the stage of life I'm in. I know it's sad. I'm just an old middle aged woman at this point. Okay. Anyway, that said, I'm going to wrap this one up. I honestly have no idea how long I've been going because I ran out of disk space in the middle of recording, which was another one of these, are you kidding me moments? And so I had to actually shut down production of recording of this, delete stuff on my laptop, and then re-record certain aspects. So I'm sorry if this week was a little choppy. And I still have to go to the gym and I haven't done my run yet. And today will be day 172 of my run at least a mile a day streak. So I'm very proud of myself for that, even though I am battling a little bit of a hip muscle soreness. And I think I might have pulled a muscle, but I'm going to do some slow recovery run today just so I can keep up my streak. So on that note, I want to publish this. I have some grading to do (laughs) and um, I'm going to hit the gym and then enjoy my three-day weekend. And I hope you guys do as well. So I hope I made you smile at least once a day and have a great week. I will see you next Friday. Bye guys.